Stand together. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. Glad you guys are here. We get to take a, a few minutes now and, and sing to our Heavenly Father, worship Him, praise His name, uh, just bring our, our honor and glory to Him. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we, we just ask that as we come today, uh, Lord, that you would be blessed and glorified. As we bring our praise, as we bring our, our worship, our adoration to you, uh, God, that you would just be lifted up here this morning. Uh, be with us today, Lord. Would your, would your presence be with us? Would you fill us with your spirit? It's our hope. That's our desire this morning.
Amen. Let's praise the Lord together this morning. Chapter 145, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. And that's the truth. We know that one day when we meet the Lord in heaven, that we will praise Him and bless Him and express our adoration and worship uh, every day for eternity. Uh, but we get to get started today. We get to bring our praise, our worship to the Lord today. I love that verse that says His greatness is unsearchable. And we know that's true. His, his love, His kindness, His mercy towards us is unsearchable. His, his might, His power is just 
beyond anything we could know, and he deserves our praise, our worship. So let's sing those words again. Let's lift our voices up to the Lord and declare his mighty power and sing his praise. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. Now sing it out together, we sing. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. We lift your name. the blood you poured out by your sacrifice we have been made holy blameless in your sight no longer separated from the father's face you lift up our prayer hearing every led into his presence we're brought without our faults no longer separated from the holy place sing at the throne at the throne of
washed in perfect grace Oh Jesus Christ You have made a way Where there was no way Your sacrifice Cleanses every stain Washed in perfect grace Thank you that we can boldly come before your throne, Lord, that it's, it's nothing that we have done that, that deserves or merits being able to approach you. It's, it's simply what you have done. Jesus Christ, you have made a way where there was no way. And Lord, we thank you for that. So this morning, we, we take advantage of the opportunity to come before your throne to experience your presence to to receive mercy and help in our time of need as your word declares which is found at your throne of grace and so lord we we humbly just come before you today and father we also want to take a moment now to to give to you to give our tithes, our offerings to you. We believe that this is also an act of worship toward you. And so, uh, Lord, we want to admit and declare that, that everything is yours and what we have is a gift from you. And so we just take part of that and return it to you uh, thankfully and joyfully today. And so, Lord, would you bless what we give and receive it Lord, we want to be a part of the, the kingdom work that you are doing, and this is one of the ways we get to do that. So as we give to you today, Lord, we just ask your blessing over it. In Jesus' name, amen. And you guys can take a seat. In just a moment, our ushers will come and receive our offering. And this is a time for our, our church family to give. If, if you're not a part of our, our church family, if you're visiting today or new, please don't feel as if you have to give. But we're going to give to the Lord now and uh, also continue to sing and worship together. the sound of your name. Holy, holy is the Lord, worthy to be praised. Filled 
with your wonder, here I surrender, held in the our praise, our worship to you. We declare your name, Yahweh, the great I am. Or like we just sang about uh, that, that spirit within us, the spirit of the living God has made its home within uh, us. Like we have received you, Lord, you have made your home within us. And you are leading us and drawing our eyes and our attention and our hearts towards Jesus. And so it's Jesus that we pro proclaim. It's Jesus that we declare uh, this morning. And we want to set our eyes towards the Lord and set our hearts towards the Lord. So uh, we just pray, Lord, with that, with that spirit of God within us, just draw us to yourself. And as we prepare in a moment to open your word, divinely inspired word of God, the living word of God, uh, Lord, would it, would it impact us in a powerful way today. There's such power and authority in your word. And so uh, we're just, Lord, just eager to meet with you and hear from you. So just pray your blessing over that time. 
the rest of our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, hey, before we continue, maybe take just a second and uh, say hello to someone next to you. Maybe greet them, say good morning, and then we'll continue. All right, guys. Good morning, everybody. My name's Luke. It's very good to see you guys here today. You know, we'd like to welcome our newcomers. We thank you for choosing to be here with us today. So we'd like to give you a gift and get to chat with you guys. So please stop by at the Welcome Center right after. And also, we'd like to welcome the new military families. We'd like to welcome you. That's right. Amen. We'd like to welcome you to our church, and we'd like to welcome you to our beautiful Monterey Peninsula. Um, You guys are pretty awesome. So guys, fathers, papas, daddy, dada, poppies, happy Father's Day, right? Yeah, you know, I've actually got two of my own. I've got a -a two-and-a-half-year-old, not Finley, Levi, and I've got a three-month-old baby named Finley, and I've been a Christian for six years, but... This last year has been very special to me because I've learned how it is to be an Abba father. You know, my two and a half year old Levi, he's super awesome, he's so fun, we get to play, we get to chat, but he also starts to disobey and and becomes a little bit more challenging. But I can honestly look at him and say, hey man, I love this guy so much, no matter what, no matter what. And that's who God it is for us, guys. He's not just our Savior, our Lord, but he is that Abba, Father, who will love you no matter what happens in your life, no matter where you're at. So no matter what your uh, relationship is with your Father here on earth, whether it be good, bad, or non-existent, don't forget, he's up there. He loves you. He will never forsake you. So guys, sorry, you're not going to get a rose, but you guys are going to get a big, fat donut, all right? (laughs) So I'm actually going to get one myself you know, all weekend. It's cheat day. Um, like my wife likes to say, YOLO, you only live once. So don't forget, get one over there at the Welcome Center. So last year, our church started this uh, outreach program called uh, Cherish Boxes. And these boxes are filled with comfort items that are given to the Cherish Center that they give to kids who are waiting to be placed into a family, uh, a foster care family. So these, these have, have helped so much. So if you guys could watch this video with me to find out how you could do this. Cherish boxes exist to provide children with age appropriate gifts to occupy them during an extremely sensitive time. Every month, dozens of children are brought to Cherish Center as they await foster care placement. The boxes are filled with things just for them that they can keep with them permanently, and they're packed by you. First, decide which age range and gender you're going to pack a box for. Then purchase a photo storage box from a craft store like Michael's. They're about the same size as a shoe box and come in all sorts of fun colors and patterns. Then, fill it with all the essential items included on the cherished box's packing list, and then enough extra items to fill the box. Before you close the box, make sure to include a brief and age-appropriate note that speaks love, worth, and encouragement over the child who will be receiving this box. Something like, you are loved, you are important, or this box was packed just for you. Now it's time to seal your box with a rubber band so everything stays together, and make sure to cut off the label on your card and tape it to the narrow side of the box. You're almost finished. Return your box to the Welcome Center on Sundays or to the church office during the week. Our coordinator will collect the boxes and deliver them regularly to Cherish Center so they will have one ready to give to a child the moment they enter foster care. 
And so we'd love to see all the kids get one of those. So if you guys could get an empty box after and fill it with God's love so these guys could, these kids could get it. Now, not this week, but the next week after that, June 26, we're actually going to be canceling Tuesday night Bible study because most of our pastors and our staff are going to be going to a conference at Costa Mesa. But the youth is going to be happening that week. So come this week. Don't come next week. So, guys, we're going to get into the word with Pastor Matt. If you guys need a Bible, please raise your hand up, and we'll get one right to you. Thanks, Luke. Good morning. Good to be here with you guys. Welcome if you're new. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And our lead pastor, Nate, is uh, getting some time away with his wife, Christina, but he'll be back in the pulpit next Sunday, which we're looking forward to having him back. And... uh, In the meantime, I'm delighted to be able to share God's Word with you. So we're going to be in Psalm chapter 30 today and just give you a little bit of um, kind of, uh, I guess, context around why Psalm 30. Nate and I were talking about what I'd be sharing today, and, you know, he's been going through the life of David ever since January, and uh, we're kind of going through 1 and 2 Samuel, reading about this incredible man of God, man after God's own heart. And he said, you know, it'd be kind of fun if you were able to teach a psalm and be able to kind of uh, maybe teach a psalm that happened around the same time as where we've been studying. So we'll talk about it. But this psalm, some have thought, uh, happened around 2 Samuel chapter 5, which is what we looked at a couple weeks ago. So kind of cool to be able to peer in, see where David was, what his heart was thinking, mind was thinking, that kind of a thing. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning as we look at Psalm chapter 30. So I want to read that, and then um, we'll jump right into it after we pray. So let's read first. It says, a psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought me up and brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for this passage that we have. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through it. Lord, thank you that your word is alive. It's living and active. And Lord, it helps discern through the thoughts and intents of our heart. And so, Lord, would you be the great teacher this morning? Empower me by your Holy Spirit to speak what you've given me to say with boldness and and love and with clarity. And we pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Billy Graham was once asked what it was that he did to keep himself current with God, connected with God. Billy Graham, who spoke to thousands and thousands of people, preached the gospel for many, many years. At the age of 99, just recently went to be with Jesus. And he said the thing that he did to stay current with the Lord was to read five psalms every day. Five psalms every day. The psalms have been among the favorite and most read chapters of the Bible for Christians for many, many years. And the Psalms or songs as they are, we see a huge range of human experience and emotion represented and documented in some incredible detail and with incredible honesty. And for us that have read the Psalms, you know, as you read through and as the psalmists are pinning their thoughts and their feelings and their emotions and their desires, I'm sure you have, like me, read a passage and gone, that's exactly how I feel. That's exactly where I'm at right now. This is what the Psalms do for us. 
I'm sure if we were to go around this room and have everyone share what your favorite psalm was, there'd be duplicates. You know, Psalm 23 would be high on the list probably. Psalm 103, some pretty epic psalms. But there'd also be a great uh, mix of variety too because the psalms are so personal. In the same way that songs are personal and they hit us where we are and we can remember how they've been spoken into our lives at certain times in our lives. And I can tell you for me, for sure, the psalms have been used by God to speak comfort and encouragement in times where nothing else was really ringing true in my heart. The Psalms are precious for us. And Psalm 30 is no exception. Psalm 30 is a Psalm of David. Did you notice the inscription at the beginning there? It says, a song at the dedication of the temple. Now, Psalmist Uh, did this regularly to kind of give us an understanding or context around why they wrote this song. We got to do a little bit of uh, uh, unpacking this because we know that David didn't build the temple, right? That was actually done by his son Solomon. God forbid David from building the temple because of the, the wars and the bloodshed that David was involved with in his reign. David prepared the place, he he got the materials, pretty much everything ready for Solomon to come on the scene and to build the temple after him. But I think the New King James Version maybe puts this inscription a little bit better. If you have the New King James Version, it would say this, a dedication song for the house of David. So what some scholars have um, thought is that maybe this psalm took place and was birthed out of or written out of the experience from 2 Samuel chapter 5, which we looked at a couple weeks ago. If you recall, that was the chapter where David is anointed king. He's appointed as ruler over Israel, and things are going well. God is blessing. There's a lot of prosperity there. And it says that David was even supplied with materials to build himself a house. So maybe this psalm was written as a dedication for David's house, his own palace. The other thought is that this title may refer to David's dedication of the site of the temple from 1 Chronicles chapter 21, after the numbering of the people, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So which one is it? We don't know. (laughs) And that's okay, because one of the things about this psalm is that the psalm doesn't necessarily focus on the dedication itself, as we will see. And so we can continue to glean and learn from this psalm, even though we may not know exactly the time that it took place. Some of the most well-known verses from the psalms show up here. Did you see that as I was reading through those words, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. How many of us have been encouraged by that in our Christian life, reading that at the right time, reminded of the fact that joy comes with the morning. The Lord will restore our joy in difficulty. Also, David says, "Turn, you have turned my mourning into dancing. This is a beautiful, poetic psalm. And as I read through it this last week, it was so cool to see how David opens with praise and ends with praise. Praise is kind of the bookends to this psalm. But it's what happens in the middle that I think is most significant. Because what happens in the middle, tell, it tells us more of the story of why David would get to the point where he would extol the Lord, exalt the Lord, but then also invite all of us saints to praise the Lord with him. And that's what I want to look at. I want to look at what is going on in this psalm, and I believe the Lord wants to speak to us from it today. Now, like every good story, for those of you that study story or, you know, for those of you maybe English teachers, you know that every good story consists of, you know, three acts, right? The first act in a story, maybe you think of movies, uh, it kind of sets the stage. We learn of the characters. We are, are presented um, with the protagonist. We, we learn what their world is like, and often it's presented in a way that life is good, things are going well, how could anything go wrong? But that doesn't last too long because act two comes, and then what happens? Everything crashes down, right? Oh, no. What we thought was good, what we thought was going to be smooth sailing has now been uh, interrupted. There's the, the, um, the enemy that presents himself. There's conflict. There's strife. There's battling. There's warring. This is what happens in Act 2, but then it gives way to Act 3. And what happens in Act 3? Well, the hero appears, saves the day, flies in, gets the girl, and then sails off into the sunset, Right? And that's how a good story goes, maybe. Well, in a similar way, we can look at this psalm, and I think there are three parts to this psalm that we're going to look at. But I also think that there are three parts to the gospel story 
right? If we think about the gospel having three separate acts, we think of the first act being what? Creation. That time that God created the world, uh, the, 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 the plants, the trees, the skies, the waters, and everything in it. Everything was good, God declared. Things were going well. Man and God were in perfect fellowship and communion, as, as it would say in the Bible, that God would walk with Adam in the cool of the day. Paradise. Paradise. And yet something happened. Act one gave way to act two. And as man took of that fruit, rebelled against God, declared that he could be God too, then everything crashed down. Brokenness came in. That brokenness presented itself in many different forms and fashions. And the world that we live in today is a result of that brokenness coming in because of sin. And yet, act two, this this scene where man is trying in his best attempts to, to get to God, to be able to be reunited with God, restored to God, realizing that he can't do that. And so he needs a savior. And that is where act three comes in, the redemption of Jesus Christ, our true hero coming in, dying on the cross, dying the death we should have died, and living the life that we should have lived. And so we get to live in this act three, kind of understanding the redemption that is ours, not fully realized yet, but will be one day in heaven where we will see the restoration of all things. And in this sense, we get to look at this chapter in light of the gospel. So here's how I want to break up this chapter in three different acts. We'll look at first act one, so I'll call David's pride, act two, David's prayer, and then act three, David's praise. So with that, let's jump in. We want to look first at act one, David's pride. I want to take your attention to verses six and seven as we discover some of the backstory here. David says, as for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was dismayed. It's here that we find out what is really happening in this psalm. David has arrived. At least he thinks he has. David has gotten to the point where he looks at his achievements and his accomplishments and he says, I shall never be moved. His king, uh, he is king and his kingdom has been established. Not only is he king, but he says in verse 6, in my prosperity, he has been prosperous. He is doing well. Things are going good for him and through him. So well, in fact, that he shares with incredible transparency his inner dialogue. He says those words, I shall never be moved. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. Nothing can stop me now. Sounds like the title of a Kelly Clarkson song. But more than that, we have heard someone say these words throughout history. We have seen Time after time, people stand up or rise up and say, you know what, I have made it, and nothing is going to stop me now. Heaven and earth can't move me. Famous last words, right? We almost look at this and, you know, I think for some of us, we recognize that, that, that this has been a part of the human condition and those that have come before, and we see people that have reached a point in their accomplishments or achievements, and they say those words, I shall never be moved, nothing can stop me now. But is this true? No, it's not. And time after time, it is proven that this actually is not true. In fact, we kind of want to pull David aside and, and let him know, you know, like, hey, David, you know, in a while, your son Solomon's going to write some incredible literature called the Proverbs. And one of the Proverbs says, pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Just, did you know that? Or, <laughs> you know, the Bible also says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Um, have you heard of the Titanic, David? You know, can we remind you about that? Um, it was the unsinkable ship. In fact, the story goes, right, that a, a weary traveler, she was, as she was boarding the deck of the Titanic, she, she asked a deckhand, is this, tr- is this ship truly unsinkable? And Leonardo DiCaprio turns and said, no, just kidding. But um, no, the deckhand turned and he said, hey, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Mm. And sadly, it was not true. That, that ship did sink. In fact, we look at words like this that David says, and, and you know, as good Christians, we would never utter these words. It's so not spiritual. 
Like, no, you won't get me sand, you know. I've arrived. I've done it. Nothing can stop me now. But how many times does that same type of self-assurance or self-confidence well up in us? And we get to the point of saying, look what I've done. I've done pretty good. I've kind of made it. I nailed that sale. I rocked that exam. I've, I've gotten the esteem and the respect of my colleagues. Man, I, I, think, I think I've made it. Nothing is going to stop me now. And we fall into the same trap that has tripped up the people of God since the beginning of time, that same lie that was fed to Adam and Eve. You can do it on your own. You don't need God. You've made it. It's been called the sin beneath all sin. And it's that sin that creeps at the door of every one of our hearts. It's the sin of pride. C.S. Lewis, who um, God has used in my life massively to, to shape my faith and the way that I view God and Christianity. He, he, his landmark book, Mere Christianity, it's a collection of his writings and it's compiled uh, four different sections. And one of the sections in his book is called Christian Behavior. And he talks about some of the Christian virtues that we are to have. But there is one chapter in there that's an interesting uh, chapter and even the title of it, it's called The Great Sin. And I wanna read to you from this chapter of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity the chapter entitled The Great Sin. He says, Today I come to that part of Christian morals where they differ most sharply from all other morals. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. I've heard people admit that they're bad-tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink, or even that they are cowards. But I do not think I've ever heard anyone who is not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. At the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault that makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in and ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking of is pride. C.S. Lewis, he just nails it, right? He nails us. I mean, happy Father's Day, by the way, dads. <laughs> Let's talk about pride. Pride leads to every other vice. He says it's the complete anti-God state of mind. Did you hear what he said earlier? He says, there is no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. Somebody has said that you can tell you are struggling with pride when someone else's pride especially bugs you. Oh, yeah, that one kind of hurts, huh? Pride seems to be almost a virtue in our day, though. That's, that's the tricky thing. This self-confidence, this self-assurance, it's almost encouraged from our society, whether it's athletes calling themselves the greatest, or it's artists, musicians letting us know that they're the best. Kanye. <clears throat> pride. pride is something that we all are susceptible to. Arnold Palmer, you know, the, the great golfer, recalls a lesson that he had to learn about pride. It was the final hole of the 1961 Masters Tournament. He says this, I had one stroke lead and I had just hit a very satisfying tee shot. I felt I was in pretty good shape. As I approached my ball, I saw an old friend standing at the edge of the gallery. He motioned me over and stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. I took his hand and I shook it. But as soon as I did, I knew I had lost my focus. On my next two shots, I hit the ball into a sand trap, then put it over the edge of the green. I missed a putt, and I lost the Masters. He says, you don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it and become determined that you will never do that again, and I haven't in the 30 years since. Pride can be so subtle, can't it? And I think this is maybe the scariest part for us Christians. Lewis would go on to say in that chapter, that pride can smuggle its way into the very center of our religious life. You see, we can caricature pride. We can say, oh yeah, I see that musician, I see that artist, I see that athlete, I see that politician. You know, maybe, maybe that's what pride is, that just kind of this self-proclamation, this self-assurance that everyone knows about. But there is a more subtle form of pride for us Christians, and that is when our pride gets religious. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 18. I want to read from this chapter 
Luke chapter 18, it says there, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and those that looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And this was Jesus' assessment of the two. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, Jesus tells this story because of those that were confident of their own righteousness, because of their religious pride. Now, righteousness is another word for saying being declared right. It means someone approves of you. It means that someone says, hey, you're okay. You're all right. And how many of us want that? We, we desire that. We long for that. Whether we admit it or not, we want to know that we're accepted. We want to know that we're approved, that someone thinks we're okay. And often in our, in our lives, we go on searches for that acceptance, that approval from man. But the truth is, that, set, that, that acceptance, that approval that we need, it drives us to many unhealthy, ungodly uh, 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 things. And in fact, um, many people spend their whole lives looking for that approval and that acceptance without finding it. In fact, Madonna was quoted once in Vogue magazine by saying this, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. That's always been pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. Now, that's the sad reality of many that search for acceptance, that search for approval, that are looking to be declared righteous. And we see the Pharisee and the tax collector, they're going after the same thing, that kind of righteousness, but they go at it in different ways. Notice how the Pharisee goes at it. What was he making the basis for his acceptance before God? All the stuff that he did. All the religious stuff. Look what I do. I am not like this other person. In fact, <laughs> I go to church every Sunday. I serve, actually, at the second service. <laughs> Look at me. I, I fast twice a week. I, I give a, a, at least a tenth of all that I get to the poor. God, here's my resume. Of course, you're going to declare me right, because I'm not like all these other people. You see, his righteousness was based on the externals. His righteousness was based on the outside. It was all his external behavior. It was keeping or breaking the rules. Notice he didn't say, as one pastor points out, God, thank you that you are making me more loving. Thank you that you are growing me in patience. Thank you that I am loving you more and loving my neighbor more. No, this is all the things that he has done himself. And in fact, he separates himself from everyone else. And this is what one pastor says. He says, if you see sin as almost completely external action, then sin is out there, not in here. And you can almost avoid sin as long as you stay away from people that do it. So, if you're going to try to stay away from sinners, don't come to church, first of all, right? Because <laughs> that's what we're filled with here. This is a church of imperfect people serving and worshiping a perfect God. That's a good thing. But for this Pharisee, he saw his sin was just behavior. It had nothing to do with his inner heart motives and what he was thinking and feeling before the Lord. In fact, it says that he says, I fast twice a week. This was not even a command from the Jewish law that he must fast twice a week. Uh, this was something he chose to do and added on to any kind of requirement for righteousness. And so it's his way of saying, I'm a better religious person than anybody else. When it comes to my religion, when it comes to my dedication to the faith, look at how good I'm doing. I read my Bible every day. I give. I only listen to worship music in the car. 
(laughs) Whatever it may be that we add to the gospel or we add to our faith and say, God must bless me now. God must love me more now. God must have his favor on me now because of look at what I'm doing. Someone has said in the Pharisee, we see that underneath the veneer of God-centeredness is self-centeredness. And this is what pride will attempt to do at every turn. It will attempt to make us our own savior. You see, there are two ways to miss God. You can miss God by doing bad things and rejecting God's salvation and the gospel. But you can also miss God by doing good things and believing in your own righteousness to earn right standing before God. Is that crazy? Jesus would even tell us in the Sermon on the Mount, he just... He, he, he blows all of our minds, right? Because it's not cookie cutter. It's, not, it's so counter to the way we think. Jesus said at that point in chapter six that you could pray, you could do a religious thing, but if you do it with the wrong motives, then you're missing the point. Where we think it's just about doing the, the Christian stuff. I gotta do more of this stuff and I gotta do less of the, the stuff in the world. And Jesus says, it's more than that. It's more, yes, these things are good, to pray, to read our Bibles, to go to church, to serve, all of that is, is good and important. But if, it's doing, if we're doing it because we're trying to earn standing before God, we're missing it. That's not what the gospel says. Pride creeps into our service. Pride creeps in to our ministry, and we start, we start thinking that what we are doing is pretty amazing. And notice in verse 7, back in Psalm 30, David even says, By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. It was interesting that it seems that David even sprinkles in some recognition that, God, you have brought me here to this point, but it's almost as if he's saying, I'm going to take it the rest of the way. God, you got me here. I recognize that. Your favor's been upon me, but now I got this. Take a break, Lord. (laughs) Go work on another sinner. But, uh, But, you know, I've got this. Nothing can stop me now. And guys, that's where Act 1 ends, and that's where we move into Act 2. Let's look at David's prayer. Look at the last part of verse 7 here. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. Another translation puts it this way. Then you looked the other way, and I fell to pieces. Isn't this so tragic? I mean, to see David at the height of his prosperity, declaring he would never be moved Lord, here I am, largely in part because of what you've done, but I have made it. And then he says, you hid your face from me, and I was dismayed. What does the face of God represent in the Old Testament? Well, often it represents God's blessing, his presence, his favor. So it seems that God removed that from David's life to where David felt the weight of disconnection with God. Because of David's pride, God brought him to a humbling place of realizing that God is not going to compete with that in the sense that David was wanting to rule his life. And so God removes that covering, that blessing in David's life, and it leaves him shattered. It leaves him broken. C.H. Spurgeon would say this, this proves first that David was a genuine saint, for no hiding of God's face on earth would ever trouble a sinner And secondly, it shows that the joy of the saint is dependent upon the presence of his Lord. And isn't that true? That's what pride and self-righteousness will do in our Christian life. It zaps the joy out of our Christianity. We start living for the to-do list. Christianity becomes a list of rules that we can or cannot break. And it zaps the joy out of life. It zaps the enjoyment that abundant life that we read of Jesus offering, we go, man, why am I not feeling this? I feel like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. But we miss the joy. As David realized here, he is shattered. No matter how firm the mountain was that he was upon, that he felt its security was broken when there was a break in his communion with the Lord. But God lovingly and tenderly removes his face from David. It It's interesting to me that David would recount for us kind of what happened as a result of God removing his face from him. We don't know everything that directly happened, but we can kind of surmise what what took place. Look at verse 1 through 3 with me. He says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up 
You have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help. You have healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from Sheol. You restored me to life from those who go down to the pit. We think that there must have been some sort of physical consequence or physical ailment that came over David, maybe as a result of his pride and a decision that he made in the midst of his pride. There could have been a near-death experience even, maybe in battle or in war, getting to the place where he was almost overtaken by his enemy, as he says there. But the Lord delivered him and saved him. The Lord brought him out from the pit. The Lord even healed him. He may have gotten sick, thought he was going to die. It seems here that he was at a near-death experience. And it's clear that David assigns this point of his life to the fact that God had removed his favor. Look, look at verse five. He says, for his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. We learn from Hebrews chapter 12 that God is a God of love, but God also will discipline his saints because of his love. For those of us that are dads, parents, we understand that discipline being done in love is necessary for our kids to develop into the humans they need to be, right? I mean, I've got a five-year-old. Discipline is just a normal part of our everyday, right? And so we see a five-year-old acting out, and it's amazing how much, you know, fallenness there can be in a little individual like that. Um, they're so cute, but they're, yeah, they, they can definitely reveal the need for the gospel. Um, and so we know that as parents, to let go or to say, oh, I love you, so I'm, not, I'm just gonna let you do your thing. Is that loving? No. In fact, it's actually taking the time to say, we're not going to do that. We can't do that. No, you're not going to shave your brother's hair. Um, that's not going to happen, you know, or whatever it may be, right? We say, no, we're, I'm going to lead you through that. And part of that is going to be discipline. This is what Hebrews 12 says to us as believers, because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his own. I think probably what happened here is that during the time that God removed his presence, David's actions were fully motivated by pride and self. And the discipline of God was to allow David to feel the weight of those decisions by receiving the consequence for his actions. One possible explanation is that this could be referencing David requiring a census to be taken in Israel, which he was even warned by Joab not to do, don't do this before God. The census was not, um, it, it was not something he couldn't do as king, but it was something that in his pride, he wanted to see his kingdom. He wanted to know about how much he had arrived. And he takes the census. We'll, we'll actually read about that in the coming months with Pastor Nate through our Life of David series. And after taking the census, God comes with a great consequence with discipline and gives David an option of diff three different things to basically have as a consequence. And David chooses a plague to be brought to the nation of Israel. And so we don't know if this is actually you know, referencing that. It seems like some of the details might match up, but maybe not. But, but the bottom line is here, David, he hits bottom as God has removed his favor, his face from him. David in his pride is humbled. Just like the prodigal son he comes to his senses and David realizes what he's done. And how does he respond? In the way that each of us should when confronted with our own pride, with an honest pleading for God's mercy and forgiveness. Notice verse eight. He says, to you, O Lord, I cry. And to the Lord, I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. David pleads for mercy. He pleads for grace. He gives God almost his best argument in verse nine. Maybe he's still working through some of his pride and feeling of self-importance. Like, Lord, you need me, right? I mean, I'm the psalmist. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be writing a lot of stuff for you that people are gonna read, you know, throughout time. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure if that's exactly, you know, something that we should uh, model ourselves in our prayer life after. But we love the honesty that David has here. He references God's faithfulness. I don't think this is his way of trying to barter with God. Like, remember, you're faithful, right? Huh? He told me that once, so be faithful now. I think he's just declaring, God, you've been faithful to me time and time again. To this point, David, David has needed the grace and favor and forgiveness of God in his life, and so he references that. 
And I think this is so true and encouraging for each of us. For you, if you struggle with pride, feelings of self-worth, if you struggle with self-righteousness, feeling that you need to bring things before God to feel blessed and worthy of God, here's the good news. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, we are flawed, we are sinners, and we need to get on our faces often and do what David has done and declare in verse 10, hear, O Lord, be merciful to me, Lord, be my helper. I believe this is the point where David develops a posture of humility. He recognizes he needs a helper. I can't save myself. I can't pull this one off. I can't redeem myself. My status, my accomplishments can't get rid of this guilt and this sin. And so he cries the cry of an honest sinner and he repents of his pride. It's the same prayer that the tax collector in Luke chapter 18 says. If I point your attention over there again, what does it say there? And then... The tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, for the tax collector, for David, they realized and they recognized that their sin wasn't merely external. Their sin was internal. It wasn't just breaking the rule or not following the rule to the T, but there was an inner heart motivation that needed to be confessed before God, to be humbled before God, to say, Lord, I need you. God, I am incapable of saving myself. And Jesus would say, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for justification to be made right, to have someone else approve of us, to have someone else tell us, you're good, You've arrived. You've made it. You're okay. I accept you. I approve of you. Remember when I was, um, before I started dating my wife, Bree, she wasn't my wife then. She was Bree Pritchett. And uh, I was crazy about her. And, you know, I thought like, I thought like, all right, I'm going to, you know, kind of talk to this girl. And I think the first thing I, I ever, my first conversation with her, I invited her to go street witnessing with me. I was like, hey, I share the gospel. Do you share the gospel? You want to share the gospel together? Like, that'd be cool. And uh, she accepted the invitation. And, you know, I was was kind of doing that thing. Like, all right, you know, I was working at a church at that time and, you know, interested in this girl. And so I just thought, like, I was was doing pretty good. You know, guys, how you think, like, I kind of got game, you know, a little bit. And um, I remember talking to her in, in the parking lot of our old church before I went on a missions trip. And it wasn't until later we got married and uh, she was, you know, we were reminiscing on those early days and, you know, I was waiting for her to tell me just how, like, smooth I was. And she's like, <clears throat> she's like, yeah, babe, you are so cute. Cute? What? <laughs> like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, remember that time in the parking lot before you went to rush on that missions trip? She's like, yeah, it was so cute because you were standing there talking to me and your lip was quivering. (laughs) Well, thanks a lot. (laughs) There goes any thought of me ever having game, right? (laughs) So, um, So I think that happens, though, often in in what we bring before God. We stand before God and we think, I'm good, I'm set, and yet our lip is quivering because the Lord sees into our heart, right? He knows what's going on. We try to bring our, our best and we try to say, look at what I've done, look at my achievement, look at my accomplishment, look at my track record. I actually finished a Bible reading plan one year. I, I write thank you notes. Nobody writes those anymore. I reply to LinkedIn, well, no, I don't do that, but sorry. You know, it's interesting because the good news is so, it's so contrary to what we think it is. You know, we think, I got to bring my best before God, and if, 
it's good enough, then God will accept me. And yet the good news is this, that Jesus brought his best, that Jesus took our place, that Jesus atoned for our sin, and it was Jesus who received approval. Jesus received the standing and the verdict that we desire. When he was being baptized and the heavens opened and there the father spoke over him, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I approve. I accept him. He is right. And here's the beauty of the gospel and and Christianity is that we don't have to try and achieve righteousness, but we receive the righteousness of Jesus by faith. That's what the gospel says. That because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we each now have the opportunity to come before him as we are, lips quivering, hearts open, going, I have nothing to bring. I can't, I can't stand on my own. But Jesus stood for me. In the courtroom of eternity, Jesus was there, and the father said, guilty, but no, I am going to choose my son to take the punishment. And if you choose him, and if you believe him, then you will be saved. Then you will be granted salvation as a gift. And the more that we grow in our knowledge of that truth, the approval and the love that we have from the Father through Jesus, the more that has the power to transform the way that we live. And the transformation will look like this. It won't necessarily be external in. It will be internal out. It will be an inside-out change that will start with our heart posture before the Lord, a posture of humility. And humility is not lacking confidence and and, and, and denigrating your self-esteem or your self-worth. It's not that. But, you know, as C.S. Lewis would say, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's that simple because you're thinking about God more and how wonderful he is. I'm going to close by looking at David's praise. Act three, who's the true hero of the story? Well, it's not David, right? What's the result? What's the result of David being humbled before God and receiving forgiveness? David cannot help but praise and give glory to God in worship. Notice there, it's riddled all throughout this chapter. As I said, it opens with praise and ends with praise. Verse one, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. You have not let my foes rejoice over me. Verse four, he invites us to join him too. He says, sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. Give thanks to his holy name. And then he closes the the chapter by saying, that may glory may sing your praise and not be silent. And don't think that David has slipped back into pride. That actually is more accurately, my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. He's saying everything that I am needs to sing your praise. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever the natural and worthy response of a repentant, humble sinner being forgiven is to worship their Savior. Worship, that word, comes from the English, or old English term, worth-ship. It means to ascribe worth to something. And that's what we do in worship. We ascribe ultimate worth and value to God, not ourselves, because worship is not about us. Worship is about Him. That my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. This is what David does. He responds with deep gratitude. And not only that, but in beautiful poetic language, he describes the type of transformation that happens in him. Verse five, for his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. That line, and his favor is for a lifetime, can also be translated, his favor is life to be with the Lord, to receive the righteousness of Christ, to walk in fellowship and communion with him, to recognize your own inabilities to save yourselves, your own inabilities to sanctify yourself, and that you're all a work of God's grace. This is where true joy is found because that's the result of David. Verse 11, he closes by saying, you have clothed me with gladness. He discovered joy once again, The joy that was zapped because of his pride and his feelings of self-importance returned when he got to the point of saying in verse 5, and his favor is life. That's where life is. To realize that we have the favor, the righteousness of Christ through God's grace. 
it frees us up. It gives us great confidence because here's how it starts to work out of our lives. I no longer have to use you in order to be approved by you, but now I can serve you and love you. Not because I'm looking for something, not because I'm going, what do they think of me? Do they think I'm great? Do I need to get this achievement? Are you a means to my end? But if I have everything I need in right standing before God, I can look at you and I don't have to use you. I can serve you. I can love you. It frees us up to be greatly confident in the grace and the standing that we have with our God. So today, if you need to do what David would say later in Psalm 139 and ask God to search your heart, to test you and know your anxious thoughts, to see if there is any offensive way in you in order to be led in the way of everlasting, do that. Pride is subtle. Pride will zap your joy. Pride will keep you from recognizing the great and good thing that you have in your relationship with Jesus. So allow him to bring you back to that place, to develop a posture of humility like David so that you could say, your favor, God, is life. That abundant life that Jesus tells us about in John 10, I want to experience that. I want to know that. That carries me through sorrow. That leads me from sorrow into joy. That takes me from mourning into dancing. It doesn't mean that my circumstances change, but my perspective about those do. Because often in sorrow and often in difficulty, there's loss of something. But one thing we will never lose because of Jesus is the favor and the righteousness of God in him by his grace. C.H. Spurgeon, close with this. But joy cometh in the morning when the sun of righteousness comes. We wipe our eyes and joy chases out intruding sorrow. Who would, be not, who would not be joyful that knows Jesus? And we would say, amen. Let's pray. Lord, Thank you for being so gracious and kind and gentle towards us. Lord, even in your chastening and even in your discipline, you show your love. Thank you, Lord, that you are committed to our sanctification, to our growth, to us, us being made more like Jesus. Lord, would you produce a change in us that doesn't start on the outside, but starts on the inside and works its way out. Lord, give us great confidence in the right standing that we have be before you because of Christ, our Savior. Free us, Lord, to love as you have called us to love, to live as you've called us to live, to serve as you have called us to serve, not to gain or not to get right standing before man or to earn his approval or to earn the esteem of those around us but simply in a response to what we already have in Christ. Let the good news of the gospel penetrate into our hearts of stone and pride and soften them into hearts of humility and reverence and gratitude for all that you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Why don't we all stand once again and just as David did, let's finish our time with praise, singing to the Lord. We sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. We sing, we sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name.
exalt him one more time before we go. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We praise your name forever, Lord. We bless your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.